These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. So, um, let's kind of think about where we are now in the course. We started with aldehydes and ketones. And the main thing we focused on for aldehydes and ketones, or the first thing we focused on is that the carbonyl carbon was electrophilic. We saw the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic because it has a delta positive charge. And also, we talked about how important it is to use resonance to explain as much as possible this term. There's a resonance form where this carbon has a full positive charge. So, it makes sense that there would be nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon. Uh, and we saw that unfortunately, nucleophilic attack on carbonyl carbons is confusing uh, for aldehydes and ketones because there's at least four different patterns. So we went through the four different patterns. There's alcohols that can attack in category two to form acetals and ketals. Amines can do category three or four to form imines or enamines. There's category one reactions with Grignards and hydrides to form alcohols. So it's a whole bunch of different nucleophilic attacks there. Okay, so those were all for aldehydes and ketones, categories one through four. Then you went on to carboxylic acid derivatives, um, where they're, um, what's attached here is something that's electronegative, like an oxygen or a halogen or a nitrogen. So the L group here can't be an H or an R, because that wouldn't be a leaving group. L stands for R. So uh, carboxylic acid or acid derivative is when you have an electronegative element here, because that could potentially be a leaving group. Well, the carbonyl carbon is still electrophilic. We've talked about how useful it is to keep asterisking the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen. So we're going to keep doing that. So we saw that you still have a nucleophilic attack here. But do carboxylic acids and acid derivatives follow those four categories? And the answer is no. The four categories are only for attack on aldehydes and ketones. There's a completely different mode of attack on carboxylic acids and acid derivatives. One of the biggest mistakes people make is treating an acid derivative as if it was a ketone, or treating a ketone as if it was a derivative. But they're not the same because these have leaving groups. So um, on the board, I, uh, fortunately, there's really only one pattern of attack on carboxylic acid derivatives. So I put that on the board. And it's very simple. It's attack, the nucleophile attacks the carbonyl, um, which breaks the pi bond. And then we reform the carbonyl, kicking off the L group. It's really a very simple pattern. Attack by a nucleophile and then reform the carbonyl and the L group leaves. Aldehydes and ketones can't do that because they don't have L groups down here. So it's a simple pattern. The only complication is that the thing that I've left out is all the protonations and deprotonations. And it, can be hard, it can be hard to keep track of that. Um, <coughs> but we've talked about how you can use the conditions to figure out when you need a protonation or a deprotonation. We saw that under acidic conditions, you have to keep everyone positive or neutral. And under basic conditions, you have to keep everyone negative or neutral. So you have to do any protonations or deprotonations that are necessary to be consistent with your conditions. All right, so this was a different type of nucleophilic attack on carboxylic acids and acid derivatives. Uh, here's the different types of uh, acid derivatives. Do you remember what the name for this type is? Acetylhalide. Yeah. I think it's best to call it acyl halide because acetyl specifically means two carbons. Asset means two carbons. I think acid is the general name here. Or alkanoyl halide. That's right. It's also called an alkanoyl halide, which is actually more similar to how they, the IUPAC nomenclature. Okay. Um, so to review, do we know what the name of this is? Right. All right. It's good that you know these names. A lot of people. There's one that a lot of people don't ever learn. What's this? Ester. Right. Not an ether, but an ester. And by the way, what's this? Carboxylic Right, so this can't be an H, or it would be a, in this particular case, that would be a carboxylic acid.
Hey, I'm not, actually. We saw that these could actually be carbon chains over here. They don't have to be hydrogens. Just as a detour, what's the name of this? Amin. That This is an amine. I think that's the, the chapter that your class is just starting on, is amines. You already kind of dealt with amides, and you're just moving into amines. And again, these could have been carbon chains over here, if it was, say, a secondary or a tertiary amine. All right, now these are all called the carboxylic acid derivatives. One reason they're called the carboxylic acid derivatives is they just look very similar to a carboxylic acid. They just have a different L group. It's very important whenever you're dealing with any of these to start by mentally identifying the L group. For example, uh, let's do that. What's the L group here? Hydrogen. Yeah. What's the L group here? O, carbonyl, and R. Yeah, O, carbonyl, and R. Um, and you could do it from either direction. But let's say that from this direction, this O, carbonyl, and R is the L group. This is, I think, the trickiest L group to identify. Something that's very useful then is to, again, asterisk the carbonyl, carbon, and oxygen so that separates it from the L group. What's the L group here? Oh. Right. And uh, here? H2. OK. And here? Oh. Oh. That's right. So maybe the best name is a hydroxy group. We wouldn't want to call it an alcohol, but we could call it a hydroxy group. And keep in mind, Trick question, what's the L group here? There is no L group. That's why aldehydes and ketones aren't car considered carboxylic acid derivatives. This can't be a leaving group. L stands for possible leaving group. Um, is this the happiest or the least happy? The least happy. Right. So this is the least stable and most reactive. And this is the most stable. And least reactive. So is it easy to move up the table or down the table? Down. Yeah. It's like going downhill. It's easy to go downhill, but hard to go uphill. Um, so, how, for example, would you turn an acyl halide into an ester? good. That would do a nucleophilic attack. We won't go through this whole mechanism here because we already kind of talked about that a little bit and it's really covered a lot in some of my other videos. But the alcohol attacks the carbonyl and then eventually we reform the carbonyl. And there's some protonations and deprotonations in the mix. The important thing is that you realize that um, in order to introduce an OR, you attack with an HOR. That's what people tend to forget because in the course of the reaction, this is going to deprotonate. Um, so even though we're introducing an OR, we do that with an HOR. And let me mention a common mistake that people make. A lot of people look at this and they think that what you're going to end up with is this. That is, there's something wrong with their thinking where they think that it's going to lose the R group instead of losing the H group. So you want to watch out for that common mistake. If it lost the R group, that would be called a dealkylation. But who ever heard of a dealkylation? That doesn't happen. What it's going to do is deprotonate. We hear about deprotonations all the time. Um, so this would have been a common mistake. We don't want to do this. After this attacks, um, it, in order to, um, in order to it, oxygen only wants to have two bonds. Oxygen only wants two bonds. So after it attacks, it's going to have to lose a bond, but it's not going to lose the bond to the R. It's going to lose the bond to the H. Good. So to make an ester, we could attack with a alcohol. And of course, we could have done that with an anhydride, too. We could attack an anhydride with an alcohol, because we can move downhill. Um, what nucleophile would we use to create this? And H3. Or if you wanted to create an amine with carbon chains, we would attack with an amine with carbon chains. But the key point is it has to have at least one hydrogen so it can lose that hydrogen after it attacks. Even though we're attacking with NH3, we're going to end up with NH2. Uh, if it has both hydrogens and carbon chains, it's not going to lose the carbon chains after it attacks. It's going to lose the H. And you could make this out of any of these. You could have ammonia attack here, here, or here. And all of those would make this because it's easy to go downhill. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, under some circumstances, you could have an amine attack this. 
because in many ways the carboxylic acid is similar to these. And again, you can make this. All right, if you're starting with an acyl halide, what type of nucleophile would we use to make this? That's right. This with an H would be a carboxylic acid. Uh, that might seem a little weird to use a carboxylic acid as a nucleophile, but it works. Uh, and after the carboxylic acid attacks, it'll lose the H, and it'll look like this. So that's a reaction that uh, you're probably responsible for. So carboxylic acid plus acyl halide gives you an hydride? That's right. On the other hand, you probably, would, you probably could not attack an ester or an amide with a carboxylic acid because that would be going uphill. You could only attack the acyl halide with that. So you could